So welcome, everyone. Uh, and I uh, thank you for joining us at the 2015 Annual Institute on Aging Retreat that's named in honor of Sylvan M. Cohen, who I had the privilege to meet uh, and get to know for many years as the founding director of the uh, advisory board of the Institute on Aging. As you know, the Institute on Aging is one of the oldest uh, institutes on aging in the country. Uh, my predecessor, Vincent Cristofalo, um, had the brilliant insight in the late 70s to appreciate uh, that we were in the throes of a longevity revolution that was going to change everything uh, about, what, about the way we live, uh, driven by the baby boomers, people born between 46 and 64, who at every stage of their um, uh, evolution or transition from uh, babies to now um, uh, seniors have, have transformed uh, uh, America. Uh, but this is going on globally, so the global aging revolution is um, very much changing uh, society and economics on a, on a global level. Well, Vince, in recognition of that, started the Institute on Aging in 1978, and I've been fortunate to be the uh, director of the Institute since 2002, and these retreats are the highlights, of, one of the highlights of our, uh, our year. We have many, many more activities. I'm not going to um, regale you with them, but, but uh, if you join our Institute on Aging in one uh, form as another as a fellow, or associate fellow, you'll hear about all of the wonderful uh, lectures that we put on uh, and events like this where we really try to um, do something novel to connect with the aging issues of the day. And um, uh, we have also in the Institute sought to partner with other allied entities. I don't need to convince Dr. Jason Carlosch that what he does is related to aging. Uh, some of our other colleagues in ophthalmology or um, uh, neurology or orthopedics don't realize that they are geriatricians. Their, 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 their patients are dominated by people uh, in their 60s, and so they have to adapt their care uh, to an age group uh, that is certainly increasing and will continue to increase and change the way they practice medicine. So the title of our retreat today, our joint retreat, is Aging with Financial Security, Addressing the Challenges of Cognitive Aging and Impairment. And um, this is a collaboration with the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy. This is a department uh, led by Dr. Zeke Emanuel. Uh, and then uh, um, our very own Jason Karlowish uh, launched a neurodegenerative disease ethics and policy program, I think, two years ago. Um, and um, with, with institutional support in recognition of, of the important ethical issues that emerge with an aging population, some of which we'll delve into uh, this afternoon. Um, it's particularly timely that we have uh, a discussion of these issues because the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, this is a, a, a honorific society that nonetheless does make an effort to uh, address topical issues of the day uh, with a broad coverage of uh, healthcare policy and healthcare issues. And they issued a report a few weeks ago on cognitive aging, progress and understanding, and opportunities for action. And among the issues that came up are the ones that we are going to be dealing with uh, today. And um, we were very pleased that uh, Dr. Carlos was a member of this report and, 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 and uh, contributed to it. Among the report's recommendations was to develop financial programs uh, and services used by older adults to help them avoid financial exploitation, optimize independence, and make sound financial decisions. Uh, so you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, very shortly. Um, Sylvan Cohen is described uh, on, uh, in the program, and I would ask you to read his bi biography, a, a, a gentleman who made a lot of contributions to Philadelphia in the post-war period and up until his death in 2000, uh, 2001, a, a champion uh, of low-income housing 
and uh, certainly of aging. Um, I want to also thank Mrs. Uh, Amako and his wife for all of her support uh, over the years for the Institute uh, on Aging. Um, an important group of people to recognize uh, this afternoon are those who have really made this uh, come together so smoothly uh, from the Institute on Aging and our partners in the Penn Memory Center around the corner here. Um, that's Emily Fenderson, Nicolet Patet, Barbara Overholzer, Tigis Tailu, and Kristen uh, Harkins. Um, I'll just comment, and, and many of you may know this better than I do, I see the usual suspects, many familiar faces of people who, uh, from Penn who attend these retreats quite often when they have a, uh, a more fundamental basic science focus, but I see um, uh, participants from the Senior Law Center, uh, from the District Attorney's Office, uh, Elder Justice Coalition, uh, 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 commercial financial entities, uh, and it pleases me that uh, we are able to engage with, with such a, a wide audience for a topic, obviously, that has very broad and wide implications. Um, Come back to us next year when we maybe have a retreat focused on transmission of pathological disease proteins. We'll make it simple for you, and you'll be able to understand it as clearly as the issues today. I think we really try to do that. Uh, so now it comes, uh, it, it, it is my great pleasure to say a, a few words about Jason. Uh, he's going to continue with uh, some opening remarks and then introduce our first pre pre presenter. And I've known Jason since he came to Penn. I, like to think I played a role in convincing him to come to Penn <laughs> uh, many years ago, and now he's risen to professor of medicine and medical ethics and health policy. Um, he directs, among other entities, the Penn Alzheimer's Disease Center Outreach, Recruitment, and Education Corps. This is our NIA, National Institutes on Aging, funded center, so one of 28 centers in the country funded by the National Institutes on Aging. We're in our 25th year and scrambling, or not scrambling, we're working diligently to put our competing renewal application together for a September deadline so that we will hopefully be renewed for years 26 to 30, except if we cure Alzheimer's disease, that would be my greater desire, so we could move on to something else uh, equally pressing and urgent. But uh, Jason also, with the departure of Stephen Arnold, if you didn't know, Stephen Arnold left uh, Penn uh, May 1st uh, for a position at, at Harvard, and uh, Jason and David Wolk have uh, filled his leadership positions admirably, both as associate directors of the uh, Institute on Aging, and Jason continues his role as uh, co-director of the Clinical Corps, and as I just mentioned, the Education uh, out, Outreach, Recruitment, and Education Corps. Jason is... is uh, a standout in this area uh, and a standout in the ethics related to neurodegenerative diseases. Everywhere I go when the question comes up about the ethical issues of biomarkers, uh, of uh, decision making, providing knowledge to patients, their decision making capabilities, voting, uh, Jason, Jason's name comes up again and again. He really is a leader in this area and um, uh, he takes credit for the program, not me. I think it's a wonderful program. We certainly discussed it uh, intensely together, uh, but it, he's creatively put this uh, together. I think you'll enjoy the afternoon. So we, we fi finish at three, and then we have posters from three to five with refreshments, including wine. Do I, it's, it's, you have to show your, um, <laughs> that you're old enough, but uh, with wine. And then at 4.30, we announce our um, uh, poster, Awards and we're giving out three hundred thousand. No, no, not three hundred. Three hundred. Three hundred. No, we give we give nice prizes and it's nice to celebrate the wonderful science that you will hear outside or see outside in the poster sessions. Oh, let's get started. I could have the uh, that slide that's on the screen up. Thanks. So I too want to thank Alma Cohen for her and her family's support for this retreat. It's an annual event that we all look forward to. And thank you, John, for uh, making it possible to uh, devote this year's uh, retreat to this topic of assuring financial security with aging. Um, and thank you, Kathy Drajewski, for all your hard work. Um, 
to make all this possible and all your good staff and, and my folks. I want to particularly call out and thank Barbara Overholzer for her work on this and thank her for all her dedication to our programs. Barbara is uh, moving on to a new position and this is her last week with us and so I just want to give her a special citation and thanks. The, um, this is my patient, Arthur Packle, with his wife, Renee, and they agreed to tell their story, which begins, sadly, when... All right. You okay? Good. Uh, thank you, John. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this is my patient, Arthur Packle, with his wife, Renee. And their story begins with them leading a typical and happy suburban life. Uh, him uh, working as a lawyer and selling insurance, and she looking forward to planning retirement, uh, 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 including vacations and trips to Paris, for example. And then it all came crashing down. It came crashing down because she had discovered that he had mispaid uh, two of uh, the, some of their bills and also had made some business transaction decisions, which ultimately re would result in them having to sell their business to uh, recover it in uh, a bankruptcy. I diagnosed him with Alzheimer's disease, and the rest is a sad story. Uh, they agreed to tell their story on the cover of the New York Times several years ago as a point that money woes can be the earliest clue to Alzheimer's. One of the hardest IADLs to do, managing your money, and therefore can be the earliest presenting symptoms. And it isn't just neurodegenerative diseases that causes this challenge of managing and maintaining one's financial security. Um, these are data taken from large population studies on just older adults, not people with uh, neurodegenerative diseases, showing that after about the age of 50, we see declines in cognitive abilities, not just simply in memory, but speed, attention, and focus. These are very variable. These lines are summative statistics. Not all older adults after the age of 50 obviously experience this. Uh, but nonetheless, when you look as a group, we see declines in these cognitive abilities over time, independent of neurodegenerative diseases. This is the phenomenon known as cognitive aging. Why is this important? Well, because it impacts one's ability to do, again, one of the harder IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living, namely managing finances. This is a graphic from a paper of What is the Age of Reason, which is one of many graphics illustrating the same theme, which is over time, after one kind of learns better to manage one's finances through their uh, uh, 20s into their 30s, financial abilities increase. And then we see, as you can see, as that U-shaped curve into the 50s and 60s, a decline again in making sound financial decisions. This example is a very particular example from the use of credit cards, namely that eureka moment when you realize that that second credit card you have to pay off the debt on the first card actually has a high interest rate if you use it to buy things. And the eureka moment is when you realize that you shouldn't use the second card uh, to buy things, but only to pay off the debt on the first card. And what you can see here is that with aging, people are less likely to have that eureka moment, much like younger people who are still learning how to figure out how to work the credit card in the first place. And this phenomenon is seen over a variety of financial transactions. So my key points are, first, certainly with diseases like neurodegenerative diseases, earliest symptoms often related to financial management, putting them at risk of making bad decisions or being the victim of fraud and abuse. Also with aging, age-related cognitive changes can cause similar problems making decisions that, while they are not fraudulent or abuse, are bad financial decisions, not in one's best interest, or again, being the victim of fraud and abuse. And that's why we're here today, because as I like to say, I, in the Penn Memory Center, certainly do help diagnose and treat patients with cognitive disorders. That's what I do every Wednesday. But I'd like to say, and I, I, I'm very proud to see that my colleagues in the banking and financial services industry are on the front line of screening for and identifying cognitive impairment in America. The question is, is how are they going to organize their business models to recognize that that's an, a role that they have? The Institute of Medicine, as John already mentioned, uh, took strong interest in this issue, namely the public health implications of cognitive aging. And this report was just issued a few weeks ago, Cognitive Aging, Progress and Understanding, and Opportunities for Action. 
And I've given you the web link to go uh, download the report, its summary recommendations, and other materials. And as John already told you, uh, one of the recommendations, recommendation number nine, is to expand services to better meet the needs of older adults and their families with respect to cognitive health. And a key message within recommendation number nine are the steps that the banking and financial services industries can take to better address the challenges that older adults face with using technology, financial services, being victims of fraud and abuse. And our report lays out very concrete steps that those industries should take, that regulators should take um, as well. You can learn more about this report on our website, Making Sense of Alzheimer's, where there's an audio narrated slideshow by myself that describes and overviews the report. And all you have to do is just go to makingsenseofalzheimer's.org and you'll see it on the homepage there. Click on that and you can read about it. This is a public health problem because of a number of intersecting factors. There are a lot of older adults. I've already showed you the data about the impact of cognitive changes on the ability to make financial decisions. They need that money to take care of themselves. And if they lose that money, they can't go back to work and earn it back. So someone else has to pay, family, friends, or the state. And so this problem in an individual's brain becomes a problem of the public. And so what we have to think about is imagine a future which will be different than our present future, where the banking, financial services industry, public health APS, and medical systems are better aligned to take, identify, surveil, and intervene on this public health problem. So this is, not, this is the beginning of a new era in how we think about cognitive health in America today at this meeting. And so today, we're going to have four presentations. First, uh, promoting autonomy and protecting the vulnerable, addressing the national need for a capacity assessment tool. You will hear, and I will certainly introduce the group, from some of my magnificent colleagues on a project we've been working on to develop an instrument to assist adult protective service investigators to better assess their client's ability to decide how to manage uh, an imminent risk they face. Uh, at the heart of the matter, the ethics of a, a, a adult protective service work. Second, you're going to hear from uh, Nathan Sprang, uh, a, a professor of experimental psychology at uh, Cornell, on understanding why older adults are vulnerable to financial exploitation and abuse. And Dr. Sprang has an elegant uh, model that he's going to introduce to you about an aspect of cognition that is relatively understudied, namely social cognition, and how changes in social cognition with aging may explain why older adults are uniquely vulnerable to fraud and abuse. Bob Zednick from the National Community uh, Reinvestment Coalition will present on uh, the NCRC's report, uh, A New Dawn, Age-Friendly Banking. Key point here, it's not just about having wheelchair accessible, friendly, uh, color-coded, uh, uh, nice banking services. It's about giving people real service that recognizes both their, the challenges they face um, and how banking can better serve them. And then finally, uh, I know it's in the program as closing remarks, but I think it's better called looking forward. We have the great privilege of having uh, Nora Dowd Eisenhower uh, from the Consumer Pro uh, Financial Protection Bureau in Washington and uh, former Secretary of Aging of the State of Pennsylvania, who will deliver concluding remarks um, looking forward to what we can think, uh, expect in a new future where we take these challenges seriously. So that's my introduction, and I'm going to move now, actually, to be the uh, uh, opener for our session, uh, our first session, which is promoting autonomy and protecting the vulnerable, addressing the national need for a capacity assessment tool. So in 2007, James Lai, who was then a fellow uh, at Yale's Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, and I, uh, published this first paper you see listed here. And it came out of a very real clinical uh, uh, experience that both James and I had. James is a geriatrician. Namely, an older adult who has a functional problem, difficulty managing a task, is at risk because of that problem, but is having difficulty solving that problem. Not just simply difficulty doing the task, but figuring out how to solve it. And is presented a solution. Well, why don't we have someone come in and... Um, uh, 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 a home health aid here to keep you from falling and uh, help you with your daily activities. And that older adult says, no, I don't want that. Don't, don't bother. We developed an instrument to help decide whether that is a decision made by an adult that we should respect out of the pursuit and respect of their autonomy, 
or a decision that actually reflects an impairment in their ability to make that decision, and one out of our beneficence-based obligation, we need to step in and help that person. A critical issue in that balance between protecting individuals' rights to live the lives they want to live versus our beneficence-based obligation to protect those who are vulnerable. And so we published this conceptual model of an instrument to assess someone's ability to solve their everyday problems. One year later, we published the next paper, which was um, a validation study of that instrument, the assessment of capacity for everyday decision making, which we validated in a population of adults with very mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And the rest really has been history. I've gotten some 450 requests for the ACE, some from the usual people you would expect who would be interested in it, clinical psychologists, geriatricians, psychiatrists, other medical professionals. But many, most of the requests that we received are from busy frontline professionals in fields like discharge planning, long-term care, and area agencies on aging. People who are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis with the decisions about whether an older adult is able to decide how best to manage a day-to-day -day functional problem. These people on the front lines of working with these vulnerable older adults know that this I know it when I see it approach to deciding whether someone can make a decision just is no longer acceptable. And they know that the notion that the diagnosis of, say, dementia or Alzheimer's or mental illness is just simply in ethically inappropriate to therefore say someone can't make a decision. They know that cognitive tests can certainly help explain why a client has lost capacity, but they cannot substitute for a capacity assessment. We cannot balance our liberty with our duty to care upon the thin read of a mini mental state exam or the short portable mental status questionnaire. And instead, it needs to be balanced on a good assessment of someone's decision-making abilities. And so today, what I'm introducing you to is a group of people who um, uh, uh, made one of these requests for the ACE. Two years ago, Risa Breckman, the director of the New York City Elder Abuse Center, contacted me. Maybe she thought we could use the ACE to develop a method for adult protective service investigators to assist them in gathering data about an older adult's capacity to solve an imminent risk. And out of that phone call, I got to know the most amazing group of people. And today, three of them from that group are here to present the fruits of their labor. I would like to introduce you to Ida, the Interview for Decisional Abilities an instrument designed by APS investigators, psychiatrists, social scientists, gerontologists. It's an in-progress work, Ida, far enough along, though, that we think all of you are ready to learn about it, interact with us, talk with us about it, because our goal is to turn this instrument into a standard of practice nationwide for APS uh, investigators deciding whether a client is vulnerable and needs society to step in to help them. And I want to single out one person who is not presenting in the group, and each will introduce themselves when they present who they are and uh, uh, their role in the project. But there's one person who's not presenting today, but who has credit for moving this project along from the idea to Ida, and that's Pam Ansel, the Director of Special Projects for the New York City Elder Abuse Center. Pam, where are you? There she is. And she helped move this project along from its early idea to the day-to-day -day execution, and even today was at the front of the table in room 102, making sure we're on time. So let me now introduce my good colleague, uh, Deborah Holt-Knight, who will complete her introduction and uh, begin our presentation. Thank you. Deborah, come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Holt Knight. I am the Executive Director of Operations at Adult Protective Services in New York City. I am so privileged to be here today. I thank you, Jason. I thank you, Risa. I thank you, Pam, from the New York City Elder Abuse Center, and my colleagues. I thank you. What a privilege it is to be a part of this incredible opportunity, an opportunity to equip our workers at Adult Protective Services. So I just want to put it in context. Yes, we use Ida. That's her name, Ida. We use her. Um, but I want to let you know a little bit about New York City Adult Protective Services. So Adult Protective Services, we service over 7,000 vulnerable 
um, adults age 18 and over in a year. We are a state mandated agency, but we have a criteria. And I'm gonna let you know what our criteria is so that you know how important IDA is to APS workers. Our clients at APS, they have to be mentally and or physically impaired, and due to their impairments, they are unable to manage their own resources, carry out activities of daily living, or protect themselves from verbal, physical, or sexual abuse, neglect and exploitation, or other hazardous situations without assistance from others, and have no one available who is willing and able to assist them responsibly. In order to become eligible for APS, you have to meet all three criteria. Our caseworkers go out in the field, they meet their clients in their own environment, and they assess them for eligibility. IDA is another tool for their tool belt, um, and we are privileged to be able to be a part of this um, innovative process. Adult protective cl um, clients are often at risk of many things. Um, they're at risk of evictions, they have no food, there's abuse going on, they need clothing, their health care needs. Um, but we must intervene. We're a crisis agency, and we must intervene promptly to resolve the risks that they face uh, by obtaining services. But before we can obtain services, we have to know whether or not they have the capacity to, or the decision-making ability to participate in a service plan. Currently, we assess them for eligibility based on techniques that are taught to them in the field. They've, they are trained by a variety of, of people and institutions. But We've never had a tool before. So we are privileged to have this decision-making ability tool. But you have to know that comes with some challenges. We've been doing um, assessments for years a certain way, and now we're introducing a new concept to our workers. In the summer of 2014, we had a mini pilot project and as Jason has stated, we're in the middle of a new project. But let's talk about some of the challenges. So it was my um, responsibility, as well as our deputy commissioner, to promote buy-in. Our workers looked at us and said, Ida who? Why do we need Ida? Ida, we already know how to assess our clients. So we had to promote buy-in. We had to tell them how IDA was going to just be another tool for them to use in the field, um, a concrete tool, that they would all be using the same tool. And we had to let them know why IDA was needed and why it was so important in helping them make decisions. But you know that change is hard. People are resistant to change. And some of that came up in our discussion. People were emphatic that they had enough tools on their tool belt and they needed nothing else. But it was our job to show them that change is good. We had to coach them. We had to tell them this is an important tool. This is what the tool can do for you. Um, that they will have something in their case file that can document a conversation regarding the person's decision-making ability. And then Ida came at a time that we're on the cutting edge in New York City. We've just developed a new case management system. Everybody's getting to learn the system. It's a very complex system. And then we said to them, by the way, we want you to do IDA at the same time. So we had to show them that IDA can be incorporated into this case management system. We can be innovative in the way we incorporate it into the system. And down the line, we will revamp the system to accommodate IDA. Sustainability. So we want them to do 
the decision-making capacity assessment. We want them to use the tool, but we don't want them to, them to stop. If we say three months, we, we don't want on the third month they put the tool down and never use it again. So we're encouraging them that, that they should continue to use the tool. Successes, that's where I get excited. Because if I'm not excited, they're not going to be excited. Um, I want them to know that we're equipping them. We're equipping them with something new, something innovative. They had a chance to meet Jason. They were excited about meeting Jason. Um, we want to build their confidence in, the, in their assessment skills. Ida gives the opportunity, and you'll hear more about the training, to build confidence. It's a very difficult um, job at APS. It's very difficult to make decisions regarding someone's decision-making ability, but Ida gives them what they need to build their confidence. They also have the opportunity to participate, participate in the development of Ida. So, I'm sure many of you have heard this, that new innovative things come through programs, new ideas, and workers often say, who really cares what we think? But they, in this initiative, they had a chance to give their ideas, and they actually saw the tool evolve as a result of their ideas. So in other words, somebody does care. Somebody is listening to us. And they're trailblazers. The fact that we are here today represented at, at this fine institution, we are trailblazers. The tool is being used as we speak in the field. We're on a pilot project. Um, they're going to come back to us next week with the results of their tools, and their, tool, and their comments will matter. Their comments will actually have an impact on the tool promoting the safety of vulnerable clients. Ultimately, that's what it's going to do for us. So we're going to look at this instrument and we're going to see the impact that it has on vulnerable adults. And we believe that by incorporating this into our way of doing business, our clients will benefit. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm um, Bob Abrams. Um, only my mother calls me Robert. Um, and uh, I'm a uh, psych geriatric psychiatrist at Weill Cornell. I've known Risa uh, Breckman for many years and was thrilled to be invited to be kind of the house psychiatrist on the IDA project. <clears throat> um, Ronnie, I need your help again. Oh, let's see, here we go. Okay, so um, it falls to me to describe Ida for you and tell you where we are so far. Um, and uh, so just by way of background, what were the goals of the Ida team? So just as uh, Jason's ACED and SPACED are about standardizing psychiatric determination of capacity, with the Ida, uh, we aimed uh, to create a standardized interview for APS to gather information to assist psychiatric determination of decisional capacity. Now, we know capacity is mostly a psychiatric assessment in most jurisdictions in this country, but in our city, uh, the human services resources psychiatrists have just a brief window uh, of time to make these important determinations, and they lack um, all the information that they really might need. So uh, we saw a role for APS here in helping to gather this information. Um, we also uh, wanted to create IDA to help assess decisional ability more broadly. In other words, not just limited to capacity and guardianship. We thought this would add a valuable dimension to the APS uh, assessment protocol. And, and help judge uh, clients' eligibility for APS services in the first place, which uh, Deborah Holt Knight tells me is a critical step in, in APS uh, land. Um, 
so, uh, so, th so that it's not just about uh, capacity and guardianship. Um, and uh, so the final goal is to adapt uh, JSON's ACE and SPACE as an addendum to the APS evaluation to be used not for every client, but when the client is about to make a risky decision. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So the process. Uh, what, what basically is the process that we took? Well, there's a gang of four. Uh, Ronnie Lafaso, who will speak right after me, uh, Pam Ansel, uh, Risa Breckman, and myself, have been meeting weekly to uh, report uh, and to discuss what's going on, report via telephone to a wider multidisciplinary group, which included uh, Jason, Deborah Holt Knight, from whom you just heard, um, and Lynn Sabursky of APS, plus many other professionals. The process of essentially involves rewriting the ACE and SPACE to reflect APS usage um, and to create realistic test cases. So, what by APS usage, I mean the language that they use. So for example, the most immediate risk. So if you had someone who, a client who's a hoarder uh, and ha but has a non-functioning smoke detector, it's the non-functioning smoke detector that's the immediate risk. The hoarding is a chronic one. And service, service is the APS term for intervention or solution, um, but we used that language. So where are we today? Um, the first version of IDA has been written and revised, and uh, revised based on a mini pilot that we did this summer with a small group of APS workers. And then it was introduced to a much larger group of APS workers and supervisors in a day-long conference. Now that larger group is out in the field with it, and we'll come back next week to report and ultimately will revise uh, based on what they tell us. Um, where are we now and what does IDA look like at this point? So IDA borrows both concepts and structure from the space. Um, the concepts are basically understanding and appreciation. Um, in brief, understanding we regard as the general case. Um, and appreciation is the application to the particular client. The structure, it's a semi-structured interview format that basically deconstructs the client's thought processes. So um, it breaks down the decision-making um, uh, uh, function step by step. So how does that work? So first, the APS worker identifies the most immediate risk or problem. Then there are six steps or I like to think of them as anchor points. And here they are, I'll try to describe them briefly. Um, step one is the understanding. Again, that's the general case. So the worker states the problem in general terms, that is for other people, and asks the client to repeat back in his own words to demonstrate understanding. So um, the example that Jason just gave, an, uh, some people who are elderly and unsteady on their feet are at risk to fall at home. That's the general case. Step two is appreciation. Um, the worker asks the client, um, does this affect you? Are you in this situation? Then step three and four are both understanding general cases. So the worker describes an available service to address the problem and then ask uh, the client to repeat it back. So um, there is the service would be home care uh, to help with daily chores and reduce risk of falls. Um, and then step four, the worker describes the advantages and disadvantages or the upsides and downsides of the proposed service. And again, ask the client to repeat back. So, the advantages in general would be uh, there's a person there to write on the scene to help when needed and, and try to prevent falls and, and, and so on. And the disadvantage is loss of privacy. Um, step five, now back to appreciation. The client is asked about the advantages and disadvantages, upsides, downsides of the service to him or her personally. And then finally, the client's asked what uh, he would choose to do, 
uh, and why. Now, the interview is not suitable for severely demented or psychotic clients. Um, it's semi-structured, I've mentioned that before. What I mean is that the worker follows uh, a standard format of those six steps. Those are invariable, but is encouraged to have a conversation, uh, use probes, draw it out. Um, and then the worker judges steps one through six as yes, no, or maybe. You know, is there understanding? Is there appreciation? Yes, no, maybe. Um, a judgment of no understanding in step one, meaning that, that the client can't envision a, such a problem in any case, and no appreciation that it doesn't apply to him or her at all, that ends the interview. There's nowhere to go. But a maybe for either one is a go. And the conclusions are not just up or down, um, you know, adequate decision making or not, but also include other options, important options. The, for example, the client is making a safe decision, but doesn't really understand or appreciate the risk. The danger there is if he just goes with a safe decision, but doesn't understand it, when the downsides become apparent, he'd be surprised, angry, um, feel cheated or misled. Um, another option is the client is making an unsafe decision but does understand, appreciate the risk. You know, it's a free country. Um, most of the conclusions are to be reviewed by the APS supervisor, that's kind of built in, and a psychiatry referral might be generated as the, um, as the final outcome. And we have, I have my own set of challenges here. Deborah just gave some. Um, the first was getting the language right, appropriate for APS and without condescension. I, I already mentioned immediate risk and service as APS terms. Um, but also, um, we had some trouble with asking the clients to repeat back in their own words um, on the understanding items. Some people thought that was condescending. Um, we, we've amended that a little to say, perhaps, just to be sure I've been clear, can you tell me what I just said about... The problem, uh, as, J as Jason has told us, is that if you just say, do you understand, the client may say, yes, reflexively, but you don't really know that they understand. You haven't really gotten the information that you need. So there seems to be no way of avoiding having them say it back in their own words. Another challenge, addressing worker concerns that, uh, that Ida repeats material uh, already gone over in the regular APS evaluation. Well, the topics are the same, but the approach really is different. And then probably the biggest challenge is confronting discordance with the usual APS approaches. This is not about uh, persuading a client to do something, although that may be a product, a byproduct, but that's not the purpose, nor is it about intervention, um, but rather it's about process and uh, logic, consistency, and again, understanding and appreciation. So, um, so it's really very different than what the APS workers have been trained to do. It's not necessarily intuitive or natural. And um, it takes some skill to be developed to stay on track. Um, for example, if you're talking about understanding and you talk in the general sense, the client may come back and talk about himself. But you have to then redirect him so that you have maintained the structure uh, and can come to a conclusion at the end. So uh, lastly, final design, a work in progress. As I mentioned, after... Um, Next week, when the large group of workers and supervisors come back from the field with comments, um, phase two will be to revise it um, and, um, and go again. Um, so thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ronnie LaFasso. I am an um, internist working in the field of geriatrics. And um, 
I also have the pleasure of working on several multidisciplinary teams for the, division, for the New York City Elder Abuse Center, one in Brooklyn and one in Manhattan, and uh, have been working closely with APS workers now for a couple of years, so it's a pleasure to be here to talk about, uh, my charge today is to talk about the curriculum development and the implementation of our training session. So as my colleagues have already very well delineated for you, we had to first identify the need. And um, working on these teams, I work with very talented APS workers, but it became very clear that each of them was approaching this problem of assessing decisional abilities uh, from a very different way. So the appeal and the need for us to um, train on IDA was to have some uniformity in how the workers were approaching this problem. Um, our next step, as with any educational intervention, was to develop uh, goals and objectives. And so uh, dutifully, we broke those up into knowledge, attitudes, and skills, as a good educator might. And just to give you an idea of some of our educational goals for knowledge, we hoped that our students would understand, for instance, the difference between impaired decisional capacity and cognitive impairment, and to comprehend the difference, as Dr. Abrams has laid out for you, between understanding and appreciating a problem. Those would be some of our educational goals we had others as well. Um, for attitudes, we hope that they would appreciate the unique roles they had in assessing decisional abilities and also to appreciate the need for the uniformity so that there was a, a common language by which we were all speaking. And then the skills we hope that they would attain would be to have sufficient competence to use the IDA in the field as part of their overall assessment. And we have, I think, hopefully reached that goal. Part of the challenge for us was to assess the learners, uh, the learner level, and that's always hard as an educator, and um, the only way we could get at that, if you could imagine how many APS workers there are, was to do a mini pilot where we tried using the IDA on some of our APS workers, took it out in the field, and, and then came back and told us what their experience was like, and from that we sort of gleaned where they were at what level we would need to then do target for our full out rollout of the project. Um, we designed, we like to think, an interactive and engaging format for our learners uh, using uh, educational uh, adult learning techniques. And so some of the things that we did, as many of you are familiar with, would be short didactic presentations by, by uh, Jason and Dr. Abrams. We used case-based um, learning, small group learning, um, and then brought them back into large groups so that there could be discussion and reflection of what they were learning. And then, of course, role plays, which are always interactive and, and engage the group. Um, writing the curriculum and creating the cases was a lot of fun. I think it was almost cathartic for those of us who are clinicians to be able to get on paper some of the cases that we've dealt with through the years. So it was fun, but then it became a little bit more complicated as we tried to uh, tweak the cases to the point which it illustrated certain points of the IDA tool. And that's where the, it became a little bit more challenging, also fun, but not as much fun as writing the cases. Um, and so I think we, we produced so far three cases that we've been uh, using that um, illustrate a lot of the points that we wanted to get across with the IDA tool. Training the trainers was um, surprisingly challenging. Um, for, there's a lot of uh, advanced degrees in the room as we try to train ourselves on how to use this tool. It's not that it's such a difficult tool, but it does have nuances, and it, it promoted quite a bit of wordsmithing and thinking, and um, uh, I think we got to the point where all of our trainers felt as confident to be out there training as we would want them to be, but it, it, it took time. Um, we built in support during the learning process so that at each point at which people were trained and then tried the tool, they had an opportunity to call in for conference calls and speak with those of us who were training to let us know how they were doing, et cetera. Um, and so um, I will tell you some of the uh, challenges that we have faced. Um, 
the most important, of course, was uh, getting the AP, APS workers to appreciate the value of the tool. Um, and Deborah has already spoken to that, but also to know where it was going to fit in their overall evaluation. And I think we're still working on figuring out the perfect place for that. Um, building the trainer's confidence, again, I think we have gotten close to, to uh, those of us who are teaching this feeling pretty good about it. One of the more difficult challenges we reach, we faced was really overcoming what I call the good habits of the APS workers. And what I mean by that is that APS workers are really hardwired to solve problems. And so when they were presented with cases, they wanted to just jump to a solution and, and fix it. And I think that's admirable, and they do it really, really well. But the hardest part for us in the training, or one of the hardest parts, was for us to bring them back a little bit in the process and have them actually go through the IDA uh, in a systematic way. And so um, that was, was a particular challenge. Um, and surrendering to the rigor of the tool, and again, Dr. Abrams alluded to it a little bit, and Jason did too, there's, there's some repetition to this tool where people have to repeat and re-ask questions. And it does feel a little bit at times can feel a little cumbersome for, if you're not familiar with it. And also the order in which the questions are asked, obviously there's a rigor to that, and that was a little bit tough getting buy-in. Um, and then there were some ethical issues around, and again, we've talked a little bit about it, about beneficence versus autonomy. So if you presented a case to a worker and the solution was get home care in, and the and this client said, sure, I'll take home care, the, the workers could not understand why they would have to even bring up what the disadvantages of home care might be. <laughs> The person already agreed to it. Let's just go with it. You know, we have a solution. They're on board, but but you know, for full disclosure, there should always be the advantages and disadvantages of something discussed. And that was that was a little bit hard, and understandably hard for some of the workers to to uh, understand. And I'll just talk a minute about some of the successes. Um, first of all, most of the workers rallied. I mean, I think that we really had tremendously positive responses given the fact that we're asking them to do something so new. Um, some of the, uh, m most of the feedback was very positive on the evaluations. They, um, there was a, the high marks that we received were for the structure of the training. They felt the flow went well. They thought uh, they enjoyed the accommodations and et cetera. And that the, there, were, uh, a, there was a lot of support built in for the trainers along the way. So they appreciated that. Some of the more difficult uh, responses came, as you might imagine, uh, the lower responses came with, how am I going to incorporate the IDA? And am I ready to use the IDA? And we got, of course, slightly lower numbers on that. And I think it's because, first of all, this is a work in progress for us as educators, and it's also a new thing for them. So I'm not surprised by those responses. Um, we think that our format is, is effective and well-structured. Um, and we're very happy, as Deb said, IDA is out in the field. It's being launched. It's being used. Um, there's uh, good support from leadership, both the New York City Elder Abuse Center and APS. Um, we are happy to be able to use technology in our curriculum, so we, we, will, uh, we have videotaped our first training and we'll be able to um, uh, show the workers if they want to go back and see the training again, they'll be able to engage with it uh, on a video. And I think um, one of the most uh, enjoyable parts of this project for me has been the warm collaboration with APS and the APS workers and administration. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be a project that really uh, proves to be a very, very helpful uh, for older adults in general and for hopefully APS workers. Thank you. Thank you, Jason um, and others. Really delighted to be here. Okay, so real quickly, so NCR, I want to ground you a little bit. NCR is the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. It's a 25-year-old organization. Actually, I'm one of the founding board members. Uh, focuses on accessing capital and credit to underserved communities. And it wasn't until about five years ago that we discovered that older adults were becoming vulnerable. Wait. Okay, so real quickly, um, National Neighbor Silver. Right, uh, left. 
Yeah, okay. No, right arrow, left arrow. For who? <laughs> Nora, you know this anyway. You know, you're probably already a pro. But <laughs> so, as I was mentioning, we're a 25 year old organization, about 600 organizations, very diverse, very eclectic membership uh, fair housing, community development, um, community reinvestment, community action. Just a wide, so, we saw that through our housing council that older adults were getting, becoming increasingly vulnerable. So, we set up National Neighbor Silver. So we work with about 25 organizations around the country. We also enter into a funding relationship with many of those, and I'll talk about that later. But that gives you a sense of what we do. And through that, that led to our age-friendly banking work. But before I do that, since you've all been sitting here, um, I always like to have the silver tsunami bowl. This is our version of Jeopardy. Uh, and since I don't have enough time, I can only do a few questions. And those of you that are real experts, please don't answer. Uh, but what is the projection of the number of older adults by the year 2030? 72. Oh. 72. 72. But it's going to, you know, it'll get to 85 around 1950. But the important point here is we're going from one out of eight to one out of five in a very short period of time, 12% to 20%. So it's a huge growth in the number of older adults over 65. What percentage of older adults are one financial crisis? And we define that as it could be housing or health away from um, financial vulnerability. And this is Brandeis, this Institute on Assets and Social. What do you think? What do you mean by one major crisis? It could be a health crisis, a major health crisis, or a housing crisis, one major crisis away from financial vulnerability. 75%. 75%. That's huge. The, and the difference that Jason alluded to it earlier is that older adults, especially over 70, really don't have the opportunity to make up income other than through income support. So that's a really big difference. It's not, it, that's, those numbers are parallel in the 20, 30, 40, 50 year olds with the caveat that, you know, that they have um, income and an opportunity over their life course to recoup that. And then um, this is what are the percentage of older adults that report Report, uh, financial you know, exploitation. And this is a Met Market Mature Life Institute figure several years ago. 20 percent, one out of five. And let's think of this as this is one of our icebergs in older adult economic security. One out of five. And think of the older adults who don't want to report their kids, they don't want to report their nieces or nephews, or they don't know. So anyway, so this just further you know, corroborates what you know, we're, we've been talking about. So we, we quote the experts. Um, since part of this is you know, age-friendly banking around cost, Jason's work around the impairments often starts with managing money and some of the others. So, so why age-friendly banking? First of all, this is the older adults represent the largest consumer base for banks, for financial institutions. The largest deposit holders, the most amount of money, um, and older adult, um, then we talked about the population growth exponentially to one out of five, continuing to grow. And even the, and when we get to the millennials way down the road, it's going to be even higher. So, I mean, these are huge numbers. Um, financial institutions are really important. This is where NCRC is involved in working with banks to the financial well being of older adults. Places you know, where they can deposit their money, where they can save, where they can get support. And, Often many of the products, if you're an older adult of high net wealth, you probably get your daily call from the financial advisor. Um, but if you're a low moderate income older adult, which is where it's trending, you do not. So what we're really trying to do is form a partnership, bring age-friendly banking to, with the number of financial institutions, regulators, health, um, aging network, and others. So there's many, so these are, it's really very compelling. Um, so what we did early on was try to figure out what are some of the six principles and we did this with, we have what's called the Bankers Community Collaborative Council. 14 of the 15 largest national banks in the country were part of this discussion. So what are the key principles, both for the financial institution, because we have to make somewhat of a business case. We're not just saying, it's not just a handout, it's saying that older adults are important, that if you protect them, if you help them increase their, maintain their financial capability, and you add income support, they can, they can do okay. So, Protecting older adults for financial fraud and abuse. This is what this, you know, um, simple forum's about. Customizing financial products. Because Pro we see a lot of older adults getting overdrafts. We see a lot of fees. We see a lot, so there's been, and I'll talk a little bit later, quickly about that later. So you customize products to the market, to those individuals. And it's a 
it's diverse. We've got a large number of older adults with disabilities. So we've got mobility issues. Over the age of 85, 60% of older adults over 85 have at least one disability. So there's, a, I mean, there are many people with disabilities under, you know, under 65, but you know, the numbers sort narrowing, over, I mean, growing over 65. Financial management counseling. Again, with that's been a huge theme today is that how do we help provide management? I like to use the word financial capability these days. This is a couple years old, because I think that's really how do we maintain you know, financial capability, connect with others, and I'll talk about that. Aging in community. Should have added my two, I took out two of my Jeopardy questions, which what is that, how many older adults are homeowners? It's just, it's just under 80%. Of those 80%, 90% want to age in place. And there's huge savings there, not to mention well-being and quality of life. So aging in community, that's more of keeping, helping people stay where they are or where they want to be. And lastly, accessibility. But accessibility, not just in a physical sense, it's very important. The bank plays a lot of different roles for older adults, the local branch bank. But we're all aware that branch banking is declining. So what do we do with technology? What do we do with customer service? How do we make sure you know, the visual side, the auditory side? That accessibility is a core goal for older adults through age-friendly banking. Oh, I jumped too quick. Okay, so uh, real quick examples. View-only bank account, which is actually developed initially by a bank in Utah. Actually, it's called Bank of America Fork. Not Bank of America, which was my childhood bank growing up in California. Um, bank of American Fork. The idea behind a view-only account is that only the account holder, only the older adult is, is able to withdraw money or deposit money, but it can be viewed by the you know, grand, you know, that point you made, Dr. Smith, was really good about the grandchildren being the largest you know, of many um, you know, exploiters. Um, so it's, only, it's a view only. So it really does protect the, the older adult, and it really protects the caregivers and the family members that are part of the decision making. Money smart for older adults. Um, um, Nordout Eisenhower from Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Office of America, they partnered with the FDIC to adapt Money Smart for older adults. There's a wide variety of curriculum. A lot of it's around protecting older adults, being aware of potential fraud and abuse. That's another example. Banks are very interested. They're partnering with it. Um, and then actually, one of the very first sort of awareness programs for banks and community and, and older adults is called Be Aware. It was pioneered in the San Francisco Bay Area by Bank of the West in the Elder Financial Protection Network. And actually, the director of the Elder Financial Protection Network, Jennifer Duane, is at CFPB. Um, so she's a real good resource around other models in other parts of the country. So these are, we have many. I'm just, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just trying to throw some examples. Uh, now this is, I've just broken one of the 10 commandments of PowerPoints. Showing you too busy, but I also, I'm in good company here. I noticed that um, with some of the previous PowerPoint slides. Um, but the reason we wanted to show you this is that we organize our work around, look, if you look at aging in community, I told you earlier, 80% older adults are homeowners, and even among renters, disproportionately want to stay where they are. So then what are the age-friendly banking products and services? And what you see in, I guess I call it sort of offshoot of, off, off shade of pink, those are financial products. Those are the applying age-friendly banking principles. So if you look at financial institutions, and you look at affordable housing, that's really around making financing available for home modifications. You don't need a reverse mortgage, you don't need it, because many lower, especially in a city like Baltimore, they have very limited equity, very limited assets. They need five to $7,000 to make, make the house safe, make it you know, healthy, doesn't need to be a huge amount. So that's what banks do. Um, Community accessibility, it's having a branch bank, it's the notion of we have banking deserts too, not, not just food deserts. Um, and they disproportionately impact older adults um, or people with mobility issues. Um, In-home support, basically providing financing, um, you know, that programs, let's see, programs for federal for resources. That's, there are many income support programs that older adults are eligible for and they're not aware. So there's a growth of what we call calculators, and National Council on Aging has, has developed economic checkup and benefit checkup, and they can identify up to $7,000 a year in, un, in, in income supports or, or services that older adults are eligible for, but if you're not aware of it, you don't apply, and the money then goes directly deposited to your checking or savings account. 
So that's a huge part of age-friendly banking. So anyway, that's um, our aging and community. Um, let's talk about financial capability. Um, again, we, the cognitive decline issue. Um, I'd like to suggest, let's look at it as sort of a series of tools and strategies. Let's start with um, financial um, literacy and education. Now, it's, it's always good to have, go to a class or go to a forum on financial education, but if you don't apply it, you're going to lose it mostly. And it, I don't think, regardless of your age, and I think obviously the older you are, the harder it is to retain some of that. So just having older adults go to financial awareness or financial education in and of itself, it's not enough. I mean, some of it they'll be able to use or remember, but they forget most of it, and that, as I said. So then we get into counseling. Actually, somebody really counseling them, and that usually tends to be more on a housing or real estate transaction, but so they're actually getting ongoing advice, you know, recommendations on what to do, but it's still a little bit passive. It's better than just education training. Now where I think we want to move more towards is coaching, financial coaching, which is really interactive. It's really about the older adult saying that I need to reduce my expenses, I need to improve my credit score, I need to get out of debt, and there are a lot of older adults in debt, with a coach that really helps them, but it's behavioral. It's the older adult picks the goal or the issue. So, your uh, neighbors to the south, Delaware, um, has started a very exciting initiative that we're their first national partner. It's called Stand By Me. It's a financial coaching model, and it's not just for older adults. It really runs the age gamut from 18 to, you know, to 100. Um, about 30% are older adults in this cohort. So, um, and they get good outcomes. And they, and they, and you, you've, got to, you've, you've got to provide data. You've got to really do research. You've got to demonstrate the efficacy of it. So through the data system that they've developed, we can show outcomes of how people are saving, how they're reducing their credit, because it's measurable. So that's a good example. Um, and we look at broader financial capabilities as a life course, and that we then target and, you know, towards um, older adults. And financial institutions are becoming very interested in Part, be part of the coaching. Um, so let's see. So I talked a little bit about be aware. The real importance of training, you know, financial, you know, tellers, customer service personnel, but more than just training, it's giving them the tools to report. You know, because there's a tendency about around privacy issues, suspicion, having them report. And I was, I was chatting with Joe earlier that in Delaware legislation that passed last fall, any questionable activity that a teller identifies immediately, not, you know, immediately goes to APS, to Adult Protective Service. They've increased the budget because then they can investigate. They can talk to law enforcement. They can talk to the bank because the longer it goes on, the more assets are stripped and there's a repeating behavior. So um, that's another example. And I talked about view. Safe balance account real quickly is basically um, Unlimited withdrawals monthly, so for minimal fee, and, and, and no, no overdraft fees. Big issue for um, older adults towards the end of the month. So, and the FDIC has a whole series of models and tools, so it's another opportunity. Um, well, jumping quickly, our, our work, um, as I mentioned, we have a network of 25 organizations. We actually fund about 12 organizations. We raise our own money through national foundations. It's really important to learn their, to work with them to build a sort of um, community of learners working on simple initiatives. We have seven organizations, including two in Philadelphia, that are working on our age friendly banking campaign, um, Clarify and Jeb's in Philadelphia, but we're nationwide. Um, and so we're learning a lot from them. We're learning a lot from their work, and we also su support others. I wanted to make sure, because I have middle-aged memory, too. Um, we did a documentary called Fleeced um, with WFYI Productions in Indianapolis uh, about a year and a half ago. And we've been on 180 PBS stations. But more importantly, it's, we're trying to create discussion. We're trying to bring stakeholders together. And that's actually how we learned about Jason and the work that he was doing, because we had one in Philadelphia. So if you're interested, it's, we, it's very affordable. It's really about building awareness. You know, and it's a, it talks about three older adults how they resolved their financial exploitation. And more than just resolving it, they became champions. They, did, they helped others, they became active. One actually testified before the Senate Select Committee on Aging and had a huge influence in eliminating a very corrosive product called uh, advanced deposit loans. And then our, we do age-friendly banking convenings um, with national partners. We were delighted to have Kathleen Quinn from the 
National Adult Protective Service Association, because we're really trying to bring together banks, um, the AG network, regulators, community-based. And what we're really seeing with some of our na large national bank partners, and I don't know how, but I can definitely rattle off JP Morgan, Bank of America, and I had a conversation with, um, with Mary Tucker from Wells earlier today, and she's on the, she was on the advisory side, is that this is really important to these banks. This is huge. And they're trying to figure out, and then when you're in 25 states, do you then deal with each state, you know, you know regulation, 20 states have um, mandatory training of tellers and some have reporting. They're, this is a big business model for them. They really want to figure out and work with others to identify how to earlier detect fraud and abuse and how to work with the customer. And that's why the work that Jason and others are doing on the, showing the you know, financial impairment, cognitive decline size are, are, are so critical. So we're trying to be the convener. We're not the expert in the, in, on the health side, but we can bring people together. So our next steps, I just want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A, um, is we're going to continue our work bridging financial institutions, regulators. I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really excited that the Federal Reserve District Bank of San Francisco is doing roundtables. We had 55 people in San Francisco two weeks ago and a really good cross-section between banks. We had APS, we had law enforcement, we had um, nonprofits, we had local government too. I mean, other parts of local government. So having them, and at our national conference, and Jason heard it, uh, we had the controller of the currency, Tom Curry, if, and for, I might not want to talk too much inside baseball, but the controller of the currency, they regulate nationally chartered banks. So if you see a bank NA, that's a national bank. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, U.S. Bank, JP, City. I know I've forgotten some, but they're now talking about this as the biggest, his whole speech was devoted to senior financial exploitation and age-friendly banking, and that seniors are really important. So we get the controller, we get the Federal Reserve. I don't want to leave out our friends at FDIC, and, you know, and CFPB's been a leader because they're actually chartered to do that. Um, so this is really important, these convenings, this discussion, sharing. I've, I've learned a lot today that I want to bring back from some of the research and studies. Um, and so then what we're trying to do is do more, yeah, two, um, hey, I'm good, I'm two minutes, I usually run overtime. I usually have a slide at the end and say, please forgive me for running overtime. Uh, didn't bring it this time, that's for tomorrow. Uh, so we're now doing these local campaigns, we want to see more, work with others, and um, really about you know, bringing interdisciplinary work, getting the banks, if the banks see others interested, they have others that can help them, and definitely APS and the public health you know, system and researchers can really help them better understand and implement um, age-friendly banking um, practices and products. And so I'm done. So we want you all to join us in riding the silver, I'm from California, so we want you to join us in riding the silver tsunami and uh, really working, because it's just, it's just, it's unbelievable, the scourge, and we really, have to do something in our time to impact financial fraud and abuse. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bob. <laughs> Kathy, by my, uh, uh, by my read of the master questions. clock, there's five minutes for questions. As people are gearing up their questions, I want to remind the uh, audience, and it'll be on the IOA website as well as the Penn ADC website, um, that June 15th is a National um, uh, Elder Abuse Awareness Day, World Elder Abuse, right. And uh, in Philadelphia on uh, June 15th, the uh, Penn uh, Healthy Brain Research Center in collaboration with the Philadelphia APS will be hosting a elder abuse awareness event. Joe Schneider, I'm approaching you to uh, talk about this. Do you want to tell the world about what we're doing? Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> in, in Philadelphia, we're with Penn's help and the, and the whole Philadelphia Financial Exploitation Prevention Task Force. We have many partners in law enforcement, and a lot of them are here today, and banking, and a lot of them are here today. We're doing a Healthy Mind, Healthy Wallet initiative for seniors at the, and correct me if I'm wrong, First Corinthian Baptist Church here, and um, my assistant director. 51st in Pine, yeah. Uh, Pastor Thomas is a wonderful community partner we've been working with, yeah, so, uh, and that's June 15th, and more details. Questions for uh, Bob Zdenek? Yeah. As you're working with financial institutions to get them to increase their reporting, are there also discussions happening regarding uh, production of records? Because the biggest problem that APS has today, um, and I'm a former banker, 
is that the reports go in, but then they get stymied because they can't do an investigation because they can't get the records. That's it. Well, actually, what we did, I mean, I, mean, I was trying to get into Twitter. There's a lot more needs to be done, but we did have in late February, mid to late February, we had two what we call innovation labs that J.P. Morgan Chase hosted. It was a smaller group. It was about 12 to 15 people. That issue came up, and the deputy general counsel from J.P. was there from Chicago, and that issue was brought home by AARP, NCOA, and a couple other organizations. So they're aware of it. They're receptive. I think as we move our work forward with these large financial institutions, and not just large, but sort of our national work's more around there, is that we're going to have these working groups, and that's going to be one of the areas so that we can really get in front of some of these key people, because there's interest. I mean, they're aware of it. But you know, these big institutions, um, one arm wants, you know, says it's too much reporting, the other arm says, yes, but if we don't do it, how do we stop it? So yeah, there, it's, I don't want to, it's early stage, but there's clear awareness, and Please be part of our work. It's a marvelous setup question, by the way, for our next speaker, who from the, cons uh, but other questions. We have a few minutes still on the clock. One, two. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, great call. I, I was just curious, do, do financial institutions in general have uh, screening tools like, let's say, IDA, to uh, screen for financial decision making? Um, so. I'm not aware, actually it was, <laughs> That's what I heard another use of IDA. IDA in my world is called individual development accounts, uh, <laughs> matched savings accounts for low income, and also there's the Ms. IDA, which was the original uh, management information system for individual development accounts for a federal program. Um, not that I'm aware, I mean, they're so varied, but not, we, not that I'm aware of. What they're really, it's, it's hard to summarize the experience, of, and I also have to be very careful representing financial institutions, because I don't. Um, they're looking for um, it's simple. It's a virgin territory. It is simple, virgin but I, I, I've seen, and I'd be interested, Nora, in your thoughts, because you're also in this space too, more interest in more awareness among higher level decision makers within these, you know, Goliath institutions who've been basically merged, you know, acquiring and merging different banks and cultures. It's, so we're seeing that, as I mentioned, with JP, Bank of America, and, and a couple others, and that's encouraging. So um, that's important to them. So if it's important to them, you know, then we that will then We have one last question that was here. Call them. I guess I can shout. What, yeah. what do you do? What's the recommendation if you actually are aware of a scam going on right now? A to you is a close friend of mine, 93 years old, and it's a lengthy process. It's already been two weeks. It's already $50,000. How do you, what can I do? I sent him the websites to show that it's a scam. Um, what is there a Well, you're in Pennsylvania? You're in Pennsylvania? Are you local or? Uh, he lives up in uh, Lehigh Well, okay, Pennsylvania. So, it, well, actually, nor, nor is the former director of aging, but I would say AG and um, APS. Um, AG being the attorney general's office. Attorney general. We see office. that a lot. In there are some states. people here who, uh, afterwards, can yeah. And legal Schneider. services too. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, but legal services. I mean, a number of you know senior consumer law centers, legal service, paying much more attention and have staff devoted to it. It is a great pleasure now to introduce Nora Dow to Eisenhower from the Consumer Protection <laughs> Financial Bureau. Office of Older Americans, so. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to be back in Philadelphia. It's so nice to be back at Penn. I see so many familiar faces. I've been in Washington, D.C. for a little while now, a couple of years. I keep saying I'm going to come back, um, and I'd love to come back. But um, what I really want to share with you today, um, and thank you, Jason, for the Yes, we're closing remarks, but we'd really like to talk about what we're doing in Washington at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a name that doesn't always quite roll off your tongue. but at the CFPB, um, which we are a very new agency. We have been in existence for just a few years um, as a result of the mortgage crisis. That was really our uh, a raison d'etre. It's why we were created at the CFPB. And our Office of Older Americans is, is part of the CFPB, which is um, uh, charged with making regulations, with, with enforcing the law, um, and with supervising the big banks and they're defined in a certain way, but um, the important thing to know is that we're the new federal agency 
on the block that's really focused on consumers. So what I'd like to do is talk about, um, give you a, a, just a better sense of who we are, and really let you know that some of the work we're doing is targeted to support the individuals that we care about, older adults especially, and it's not just older adults who may be diagnosed with dementia in the early stages of it, it's, it's all older adults. It's really all consumers that we're concerned about at the CFPB, but I want to specifically talk about those older adults uh, that may be experiencing some cognitive decline. I think that's all of us, according to Jason, and Jason, we use that quote of yours quite a bit, that the first capacity to go is financial. Um, so let me just go through the slides here. <clears throat> Um, I am here from the federal government, so I have a disclaimer. Unlike Bob, who's also here from Washington, D.C., um, please do not consider this uh, presentation legal advice. <laughs> That's done. I can check that box now. Um, okay, so I mentioned earlier the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB. We were created as a result of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Our agency was launched in uh, 2011, so we started from zero. Uh, Elizabeth Warren was our founding um, acting director. Um, she has since moved on to uh, be the senator from Massachusetts, and our current director, Rich Cordray, was the head of enforcement um, at that time and is now our director, and he was confirmed uh, just a little while ago. Um, our mission is to make markets safe for consumer financial products and services and make them work for Americans, whether they're applying for a mortgage, choosing among credit cards, or using any number of other consumer financial products. Our core functions at the agency are to educate, enforce, and study. So our vision, and really this, this informs our mission every day at the, at the CFPB. Um, is a consumer financial marketplace where consumers can see prices, where no one can build a business model around unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices. And that unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices is a little dry, but it's actually a term of art. And every consumer uh, law across the country, almost every state has one, and it's a model uh, statute, and it's really very broad. It covers uh, almost any misrepresentation in the marketplace that involves something you pay money for, whether it's a product or a service. Um, and we just really want a consumer financial marketplace that works for consumers, that works for responsible providers and businesses, and really the economy as a whole. So I mentioned that the CFPB um, has an enforcement a supervision function, which means we go out and we examine banks and other types of businesses. Um, we also have a division of consumer education and engagement, and that's where my office lives. My office is the Office for Older Americans. We're one of several special population offices created uh, because the, the Congress and its wisdom, and I mean that sincerely here, realized that you couldn't just go out and enforce the law. I do, Kathleen, really, in this instance. <laughs> you couldn't just go out and enforce the law, create regs, um, and supervise. You had to do something to really address the other side of the equation, which is the consumer. So we have... Um, um, several offices, but what we also have is an interactive tool. It's about a thousand questions. Um, it grows, you know, weekly. We have, we're probably up to about 1,100 now. We edit them. We, we target the questions to these large financial decisions people have to make through their lives. So think of student loans. Think of mortgaging your house. Many people will do that once in their lifetimes. Many of us, though, more than once. Um, and we have created an interactive tool uh, where you can go and ask a question, identify, put a search term in as, as we're all used to these days. So under the Older Americans tag, you will find answers to questions in plain English. Uh, it's really important to us that they be in plain English. On financial products, services, what's the power of attorney? You mentioned it earlier and, and it's, a real, um, uh, it's important for people to know what they're signing over when they give someone their power of attorney. Um, accepting assistance with bill paying and banking and tips to avoid financial harm. Obviously, you have to get there. You have to be conversant with the web uh, and online tools. But if you do, go to consumerfinance.gov, SCFPB. You will find a host of questions and answers that can be very helpful. This is what the page looks like. You can see it's very accessible. Uh, we're actually doing the... Uh, we did the uh, first version in, uh, I think, 2012 it came out, and we're now revising that and, and gradually making it even more accessible. But you can see 
Um, there are some answers to questions here that may be of help to you. The gentleman that asked about his relative in the Lehigh Valley, they may be some help for you there, but it's pretty generic. I think we should have a chat afterwards and make sure that you have the connections you know. And there are a couple of people in the audience here that I think can help you, and we can get a little bit more information about the circumstances if you're comfortable with that. But this is where you'd start. Anybody anywhere in the country. Another service that we provide, and I want to go into a little bit of detail for this, with this, because I think that you could use this in your everyday life. You can use it for yourselves, you can use it for the people that you serve, and you can use it for people that you come uh, across that are having a problem with a financial product. We take consumer complaints, and we resolve those consumer complaints where we can. We send them to the institution that the complaint's against. If it's one of the institutions that we regulate, we get a pretty quick response. So uh, we're talking about uh, the big financial institutions with assets of over 10 billion. I think that's the number. So think of the big banks. Uh, we um, can send them a complaint. Uh, if you have a complaint about a, a, a credit card or something that's happened with your bank account, and we get a pretty quick response. Now I raise this for you. You may think, oh, well, my, my attorney general does that. That's true. And there are other uh, uh, entities that may take a complaint. But at the Consumer Financial uh, Protection Bureau, we'll take the complaint, we track it, we have a data, uh, a, a rich source of data as a result of that. Uh, we've been taking complaints uh, for some time, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But we currently handle complaints that you may have about credit cards, credit reports, debt collection, money transfers, mortgages, bank accounts, services, car loans, other consumer loans, and private student loans. We forward the complaint, we get a response, uh, we're collecting the responses, sort of aggregating that data so that it's available for others to look at and analyze. Uh, and we also have the opportunity for you to tell your story. If you've had a particularly good or a bad experience, um, we will uh, uh, listen to that. We started um, in July of 2011 taking credit, uh, credit card complaints. We started small so that we wouldn't have a problem. We've grown gradually, and now we've included all of these uh, uh, financial services and products. Um, and as of March 31st, which I think is the most recent time um, uh, we've, uh, I've gotten the numbers, we've had almost 600,000 complaints. We get uh, complaints in at a clip of about seven to 10,000 a month. Okay, that's generally the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You can be any age to access that complaint taking function. Um, but for us in the Office for Older Americans, I mentioned that we were part of the uh, Consumer Education and Engagement Division. We take that mission very seriously. Um, we have one page in Dodd-Frank that pretty much tells us what we have to do. Um, we can't do it all, but it does tell us what we have to do. Um, our mission is to help consumers. We identify older consumers as 62, but if you come to me with a problem and you're 58, it's fine. Um, it's just that when you are 62, you definitely are an older adult according to our statute. Um, so again, it's this prevent unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices aimed at seniors. Um, uh, we help seniors make sound financial decisions as they age, and you'll hear about our work in doing that in just a little bit. That's a big part of what we do. We're the only office in the federal government specifically dedicated to the financial health of older Americans. Okay, so what are we doing? We've uh, talked about this a little bit. We've really identified the need here today for something more than what we're currently doing. And as Jason said, I hope to talk to you about what we are doing and what we hope to be doing in the future, the near future and the distant future. So we're developing educational initiatives. We heard somewhere that if you tell an older adult or if you tell a person, here's what the scam looks like, or perhaps you said if they have experience with a scam, they're sort of vaccinated against the scam in the future. So the experience has a beneficial effect. Certainly you hope they didn't get taken or lose money, uh, but the actual experience with the grandparent scam. You know, it's interesting you've had the grandchild, obviously, that family member or loved one that is really, you know, uh, often a problem in financial exploitation for older adults. But one of the most common scams, I hear about it everywhere I go, everywhere I speak, is the grandparent, grandchild, grandparent scam. So somehow, a scammer, whether the telemarketer was selling you know, um, swampland in Florida 10 years ago, um, uh, you won a sweepstakes you know, five years ago, or any of these things, they're sort of recurring themes in the scam world, as we can see it. Um, the, grandpa the grandparent-grandchild scam is pretty common. 
So someone gets on the phone and you think of any of our older relatives, loved ones, friends, neighbors, or even ourselves in some day, you pick them up and say, hello, hello, and you can't quite hear who it is. And someone says, it's your grandson, it's your granddaughter. So you say the child's name, Johnny? Yes, that's it. You're almost sunk right there. Um, but it just plays on that vulnerability in a way that's very sophisticated um, and the cost can be very high. So what are we doing? We're conducting research to identify best practices and effective methods, tools to protect older adults. Um, Bob mentioned Money Smart for Older Adults. I'll talk about that a little bit more. We're coordinating efforts with federal and state regulatory agencies and law enforcement. Um, and we're collaborating with community leaders and local organizations across the country. So here's our page where you can see we've highlighted some of the issues uh, uh, that involve um, protecting older adults. And we want you to be able to go here and get information if you're interested. It's very accessible. Um, you've heard a little bit about it now. So one of the things that we want to do is make sure people understand the definition of elder exploitation. And there are some experts in the room who could do this presentation better than I, but I want you to know that it's really defined as an illegal or improper use of an older adult's funds, property, or assets for our purposes at the CFPB. The most common form of elder abuse, um, uh, only this is uh, the financial is the most common, but only a small fraction are reported. It's the iceberg. Uh, uh, description that Bob gave you earlier, maybe one in five. Um, perpetrators include family members, caregivers, scam artists, uh, financial advisors, home repair contractors, and fiduciaries, and others. Almost anybody you could run into as an older adult, navigating through life, managing your property, trying to keep your house in shape so that you can live in it as long as you possibly can. We think that older adults are vulnerable due to um, some of the issues that, that have been identified here this morning, uh, this afternoon rather, isolation, cognitive decline, physical disability, health problems, recent loss of a partner, family member, a friend. We find that the year of, uh, uh, after a spouse's death, especially for a long time marriage, a long time stable marriage, that year after that death is a time that you could be very vulnerable. Um, so one of the initiatives that I did want to talk to you about today and really uh, suggest that if you do know someone who needs this, please tap into it. So we came up with a series of guides called Managing Someone Else's Money. First of all, I want you to know that these guides are not going to protect someone from the grandson who's taking money out of their account. Uh, it's not going to protect you from a scammer on the telephone. The guides are designed for that person who becomes the financial caregiver in the family, sometimes by default. So, oh, I have two minutes left. Sometimes because they're um, the health care uh, person. They're the person who drives mom to the doctor. So they're the person that is going to be the financial um, advisor now. So it's really a concerning situation. But for people who mean well, we think that managing someone else's money guides could be a real lifesaver. So we suggest that you distribute them. As soon as someone, uh, you, you, you're shaking your head, you know what I'm talking about here. As soon as someone comes in and they're accessing care or there's a crisis situation, it's good to give a person this guide, managing someone else's money. Again, it's in plain English, it's how to, it's what you need to know to manage someone else's money effectively and protect their money and assets and resources from scams, from family members who might want to take advantage. We're creating some state guides. We're not doing one for Pennsylvania. I'm hoping that the advocates and uh, Elder Bar in Pennsylvania will uh, pick up the challenge and create a series of guides for the state. We have a replication guide for them. They look like this. You can order them for free. Um, they are uh, cover different topics if you have a power of attorney um, or if you're named um, another kind of um, a fiduciary for someone. The other uh, I, program that I really want to highlight for you, as I know I'm out of time, is Money Smart for Older Adults. We mentioned it early. It's a train the trainer program. It's designed to help you train others um, in identifying the common scams and frauds. We hope that the aging network accesses it. They're using it extensively. And we think that it's going to help spread the word about um, scams and frauds. The, the next initiative we took on was a manual for assisted living in nursing facilities. Not nursing homes, but more continuing care communities. Uh, residents um, are, are there. They are vulnerable. So we've come up with a very targeted guide to help them uh, learn how to prevent fraud. 
Um, there are four pillars of successful intervention in this setting. We think it's prevention, recognizing it quickly, recording or documenting your findings, and telling the appropriate authorities to trigger responses. Um, we need um, really more work done in uh, understanding state laws that include definitions of financial exploitation. Um, I'm not going to go into that here. Um, there is a federal reporting requirement, report suspected uh, uh, crimes to state survey agencies and uh, local law enforcement. It does not apply to assisted living facilities often. Warning signs of financial abuse. I'm not going to go into this. This is way too much detail for you today. Um, but I do want you to know that there are ways to um, target certain individuals in certain settings and give them the information they need so that they can be protected. Um, you can order these uh, guides and publications for free. Um, I, I was going to send some here today, but um, I don't know that uh, that happened. You can order them in bulk, and please do, and please spread the word about them. Thank you. If you have any questions, um, I'm going to leave my email up here. I'm happy to um, answer them. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time here today, but please just let me know if there's anything else we can do. Thank you. No, that was wonderful. I'm reminded of a wonderful uh, Healthy Brain Aging Symposium that you were the closing discussant uh, for. My time went faster today, was, it seemed. <laughs> and that was so wonderful, and you did a superb job again. So we have a, a, a few minutes for questions, and Virginia Lee. Nora, does your office do anything about the perpetrators, not the grandson, but the telemarketer and others? And you know, so I've Our office is, yes, uh, uh, Virginia's question is about the perpetrators. Who's going after these telemarketing and scammers, not the individual family members who might be exploiting someone? Um, we work in partnership with the Department of Justice um, and others uh, at the federal level and at the state level um, to pursue scams and frauds. The Federal Trade Commission um, has jurisdiction over a lot of the telemarketing scams and frauds. Um, so there is a network of federal agencies and state um, to do that kind of work. It's very, very hard to be effective there, though. Uh, the complaints come in in great numbers, so we think prevention is the key, and we really want to get to older adults first, and that's where consumer education and engagement uh, really, I think, has a, has a role to play with all of you. So in the interest of time and getting on to our posters and then the session that just Jason's going to remind you of in a few minutes, I just want to um, thank all the speakers. Especially, Jason, this was an, an idea that I didn't quite understand when we began speaking about it, uh, and then it came together very, very clearly, and I think it's one of the more novel uh, Institute on Aging partnerships with another entity to bring really, really timely uh, issues uh, forward. Uh, I have a Jeopardy question, too, but I didn't want to ask it before. I want to ask it at the end, and that is how many of you in the audience know someone who's been exposed to... Um, you know, financial abuse. We heard of one example, but now that you've heard what it's about, how many? So I see uh, probably 40% of the people in the room, uh, and that is really a dramatic statistic. It <laughs> needs to be validated and replicated, of course. There's probably a lot of bias based on who came to this meeting. Uh, but, but, I, but I think it highlights the, the value of this event and the, and the need for the kind of research that Jason is doing with all of the uh, all of the other presenters here, so I applaud you for your uh, for your work. Um, I think it also reinforces uh, the need for we as a country to do something about Alzheimer's disease because that certainly is going to be a huge driver with 5.5 million people and those numbers tripling um, by 2050 is going to be a huge driver of a, a lot of financial losses costs. Uh, but also financial uh, vulnerabilities. So let me remind you uh, what happens next. There is a poster session uh, outside. We have about 50 posters, and uh, Bob, we do uh, give prizes in three categories. You're eligible. Uh, we have one for uh, education and community, so I think you fit into that category, as well as basic science research and clinical research. We like to think we are the big tent for aging at the University of Pennsylvania and welcome uh, all uh, constituents and ideas related to aging. So I um, want to again thank Jason for his creative efforts to pull this together and I'll turn it over to him because he's going to... Well, thank you, John. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to um, 
organize this event. Uh, reminder, those interested in uh, meeting with the IDA team, the interview for decisional abilities, uh, will be in room, uh, was it 102, 202? Right out here? 102, yeah, right out here through the wall. Uh, Only two rooms. Yeah. <laughs> um, and by the way, yeah, uh, the one with one. And uh, I want to, uh, we forgot the uh, winner of the Name the uh, Instrument Contest of Ida. We were going to announce it here, and it was uh, Charlie Sabatino, who's a member of our advisory committee, uh, thought of the, um, of the acronym Ida, Interview for Decisional Abilities. And, and for that, Charlie wins a copy of uh, Open Wound, a book I wrote. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And I'll be sending that to Charlie. Um, so thank you. Thank you all.